Within you lies the ability to relieve pain and isolation, restore dignity and self-esteem, and return satisfaction and pleasure to daily life. Discover freedom from within. You have the floor. The following information is not intended to be used as a substitute for medical advice. Concerns about your health should be discussed with a qualified health care provider. Welcome to the You Have the Floor podcast. My name is Dr. Lori Mize, and I am the Chief Education Officer for the Freedom Foundation for Pelvic Health. And I am so excited to be joining you all today with two dear friends to talk about pediatric pelvic health. Let's talk about autism spectrum disorders. I want to introduce our guests, and then we're going to dive right into talking about some of the things that parents who have children with autism spectrum disorders experience from a pediatric pelvic health perspective. So our first guest that I would like to introduce is a lifelong friend. This is Mallory Burton. Mallory is a stay-at-home mom with her son, Joseph, who has a diagnosis of autism. She homeschools Joseph, and Mallory has an extensive leadership and involvement history with nonprofit organizations in Florida for families with children with special needs. And then we have Dr. Whitney Bartley, and Dr. Bartley is a doctor of physical therapy, she is the developer of the first pediatric pelvic health program in the state of Arkansas. She's very involved with the American Physical Therapy Association's Academy of Pelvic Health, and she writes and teaches coursework in pediatric pelvic health, and she's also a dear friend. So I'm so excited. Welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, thank you. So we have a lot to talk about today. We're really going to just jump right in and talk about, Mal, your experience with Joseph. And, and we have some history of talking about some bowel and bladder conditions. And so that'll kind of come out in the conversation. So I can't wait to dive on in. So Mal, do you want to just tell us just a little bit of a, of a brief introduction? And then we'll come back into your story here in a moment. Yes, sure. I am married to my husband, Justin. We've been married for almost 18 years we have two children, Joseph, who's 12, and he is my kiddo with autism. And then I have a neurotypical daughter whose name is Sydney, and she's nine. And so Joseph is um, what would be considered moderate to severe autism. He can talk. He's verbal, not conversational. And that was probably my biggest concern over the years is just wanting him to talk until we uh, it was a couple of years ago where we hit kind of a brick wall concerning his GI issues. And that's what I'm here to talk about today is that I'm not the only autism mom who deals with this. I cannot think of any family I've ever talked to who does not have bowel issues with their autistic child. It's a huge deal. But we are on the road to recovery and have been for over a year. So it's a huge, it's a huge deal for us. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll come back yeah. to that because I want to, I want to talk more about your story and where things took a turn and changed yes. for Joseph whenever it comes to pelvic health conditions mm -hmm. and things you were experiencing. Whitney, tell us a little bit about your professional story and your background. Sure. So I have been a physical therapist for almost 13 years. And even prior to that, though, even in my physical therapy education, I had a strong interest in pediatrics, but I also had this interest in pelvic health. And unfortunately, 15 years ago, I really had a difficult time as a student bridging those two fields together. Pelvic health physical therapy was pretty big in the adult world, but there wasn't a lot of research and practitioners out there for me to learn from and shadow from. And so as an early professional, I moved right into outpatient neurodevelopmental pediatrics, but I still have that pelvic health seed in my brain. And so as I'm working with my typical and atypical children, I'm noticing a lot of things about school-aged and middle-aged kids. Many of them were incontinent or unable to control their urine and their feces. Many of them wore pull-ups or had frequent infections and were out of school or in and out of the bathroom all the time and disrupting class, and, and it wasn't enhancing their learning. Um, 
I didn't know what to do about it then. I knew it was a problem, but I didn't have any resources. If we fast forward a little bit, I moved into pediatric acute care. And in that environment, still that pelvic health seat is there. I'm seeing children admitted with recurring urinary tract infections and fecal impactions. And that is where the constipation has become so severe that it actually sort of stops the rectum and the child can't go to the bathroom. And both of those situations require medical attention. And I thought something has to give. Like if this is happening in pediatrics, atypical or typical, there's got to be a solution. And I'll say too, 50% of my outpatient neurodevelopmental experience was working with children with autism. And so I saw that incontinence and that constipation, those bathroom difficulties, even higher in that population than what I did with my typically developing population. And so while I was in the hospital, I connected with a urologist and we were able to start the pediatric public health program. And y'all, this month is our 10 year anniversary. So we have been doing this for 10 years and I'm so excited about it. We help two to 300 kids a year and we truly love what we do and the outcomes that we see. I love that. Well, speaking of this month, not only is it a huge, um, that's a huge anniversary milestone for you guys and your program, but it's also Autism Awareness Month. And I believe April 3rd was World Autism Day. Is that what it's called? I Mallory, think, did I get yes, that correct? Yes, I think it's April the 2nd, though. I should probably. Oh, was it April the 2nd? I okay. I thought something <laughs> sound off. What a wonderful time to be talking about autism spectrum disorders yeah. and to really bring more knowledge and education and attention to that for families. So Mallory, will you tell us a little bit more about your journey and some of the things that you were experiencing with Joseph, particularly with bowel and bladder concerns and, and the treatments that you were involved in and just the journey of what was going on in your life at that time and when things started to turn. Sure. Joseph has been pretty much dealing with constipation from birth. We've taken to different doctors over the years countless times because he would be impacted or almost there. His stomach would be hard. He'd have trouble sleeping. And if I could just fast forward a little bit, because we would through the years, we'd eventually get him to have a bowel movement. And so we would kind of forget about it. And then it would get bad again. And this went on for years and years. It hit a, cycle. a point of, we thought, no return when he was 10. And that was when things got really rough. And he had encopresis, um, which Whitney can explain what that is. And he had megacolon. And he was basically leaking nonstop. And if he would eat a lot, there was just so much. I mean, and this went on for months and months and we just got used to it. We used Miralax here and there. We didn't know what to do. We were at the advice of doctors. We'd use a glycerin suppository so we could just kind of clean him out and, you know, and then he'd be good for a couple of days and then he'd get backed up again. And we went to have dinner with you and your husband, me and my husband and you and your husband. And I brought it up. It was like over dinner. And by the way, I've been friends with Lori my whole life. I don't remember not being friends with her. We met in preschool. I have access to Lori at all times. I could have brought this up over all the months, but this was our normal. Somehow it was a gradual process to where He'd be constipated for a couple of days and then he would go and then it would be several more days and then he would go a little bit. And so we kind of got used to that way of life. And for some reason, I just thought to bring it up to Lori over dinner <laughs> of all places. And Lori's because that's total that's dinner, where conversation. Total yes. dinner conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's a real I mean, total. It's an icebreaker yeah. when you start talking about poop. And so I said, um, and we were at the ends of our rope. I mean, it was, it was causing fighting between me and my husband. We were constantly cleaning. My husband leaves for long trips. So I was dealing with it a lot. I was not leaving my home very much. I've got another child. I mean, it was a mess. And Lori said to me, I'm sure she said other things, but the thing that stuck out to me was you need to put him on a schedule. And I was like, oh, 
I mean, it was like, and what, I mean, it didn't seem like enough. It's a major problem. I need a major solution. And this was just, oh, you just have him sit down on the toilet the same time every day. It just didn't seem like something that would work. She's the professional. I get it. She gets paid for this, but like, I still, I was living it and it was a nightmare for months and months and months. So we started putting him on a schedule and I promise I'm not going to cry over this, but this was so powerful what happened and it took some time because he had mega colon. It took a good six months to kind of get him back to where he needed to be. But it was within a week or so that we were getting poop pretty much every day or two. And it was life changing for us. And I tell everybody about it. I don't even care if poop's the subject, you know, it's just like this happened to us. If you have an issue, your child needs to go on a schedule or you need to go on a schedule. Maybe it's an adult. So he has not been constipated in over a year. And what about leakage? There has been no leakage. That's huge. Which is, we just thought he was going to be leaking, I guess, for the rest of our lives. I don't know what we mm -hmm. thought. We were just living it and we were weary, but we just kept doing it. You just keep doing whatever you have to do for your kids. And with autism, it's so complicated. There's so many things you have to be thinking about all the time. And this was just another one of those things, but it was a big thing. Mm -hmm he's been doing great. It caused behaviors to come down because he can't tell me, Hey, my stomach hurts. We know that if he's going to the bathroom every day, his stomach's probably not going to hurt. So it relieves that, that sense that we've got to figure out why is he mad all the time or whatever. So you're basically saying that when he was constipated and having these symptoms, you would see increased you know, abnormal behaviors yes. or behaviors that would let you know that something was not correct. Right. He was out of Insomnia sorts. was a problem. If you think about if you haven't pooped in four to five days, you're not really going to want to sleep. It's going to be constantly kind of on your mind. And he was having just all sorts of problems. And mm -hmm. of course it was causing us problems. It was just, yeah. it was life altering. So when we got him on the path to recovery, in all these years of trying things like Miralax, glycerin suppositories, we never went the way of an enema because I was like, Ugh, no. But um, <laughs> laxatives, I did. I gave him oral laxatives. I probably traumatized him with suppositories. But I was trying to help him alleviate the pressure and pain. And who would have thought all I really needed to do was put him on a nightly schedule. It was six to seven every night. And then he got older and he started going to bed a little bit later. So now it's seven to eight, just sometime in that time frame. We have him sit down, he uses the bathroom, and then he takes a shower and goes to bed. And wow, what a difference in our lives. Mm. Huge. So you bring up a really great point, Mallory, just about pelvic health conditions in general. So many pelvic health concerns, things like incontinence, leakage of the bowels or the bladder, pelvic pain, any of those things. So many people just think that that's something that they have to live with. And even though, like you said, you had access to me, and, and I do want to say I'm not a pediatric pelvic floor physical therapist, I'm, I treat primarily adults, but have enough information and knowledge and connection with colleagues like Whitney here who can help with that to know some of the behavioral interventions and the conservative interventions that can be done for those kids. And so I just think that's such an impactful point that I want to spend a little time on because so many of us just believe, well, this is what happens when fill in the blank, you know, and it could be, well, this is just what happens when you have a child with autism. This is just what happens whenever you're going through menopause. This is just what happens whenever you've had babies or whatever the fill in the blank is. And that's really one of the things that we want to do here with the Freedom Foundation, with the You Have the Floor podcast, is to change the conversation so that people know they do not have to suffer unnecessarily, that there are conservative interventions out there 
and it doesn't just have to be medication or surgery. And these things can really make a huge impact on quality of life. Like to hear you talk about how this was affecting your marriage, how this was affecting you were becoming isolated. It was affecting your ability to socialize in your community. That's a huge quality of life issue. And just to think that something like getting him in an appropriate toileting schedule, and Mallory gives me a lot of credit. I, I never say anything that concise. I'm super verbose. And so I'm sure there was a lot more going on in the conversation than just put him on a schedule. But I mean, there's just a lot of things that can be done that can really help alter quality of life. And it doesn't have to be arduous and hard. And so Whitney's going to talk to us more about that today too. So thank you for sharing that. And it's okay if you cry too, because <laughs> I remember that was a hard time mm-hmm. for you. I mean, just to hear about it again as your friend, it breaks my heart to hear about, mm-hmm. and just to think about how many other families are suffering right. in that way, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, I hear that all the time from the families that I work with, how yeah. it that they want to do the best for their child, but they're suffering at the expense. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, I think you used the word weary mm-hmm. and that is probably very, very common. Yeah. Very common. And- well, Whitney, can you tell us more about what you see professionally and can we kind of talk a little bit more about autism for maybe some of our audience members who don't really truly know about autism spectrum disorders? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then we'll talk more about the pediatric pelvic health components of autism spectrum disorders that you treat. Yeah, sure. So I will start with a boring scientific definition, okay? And the reason that I am is because I think a lot of people don't understand that autism is a mental health diagnosis that does have some neurodevelopmental and physiological sequelae or or coinciding things that happen with that. And so the American Psychological Association defines autism spectrum disorder as a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by impairments in social interaction and communication and atypical, restricted, and repetitive patterns of behavior. That's a lot of science words. So like, let's unpack that for a minute. When we look at a child with autism spectrum diagnosis, we first need to be aware of the word spectrum. So Mm -hmm. the symptoms or the way that the child presents may be very severe where there's very little social interaction or social capabilities and extensive abnormal behaviors, or it may be on the lower end. So keep in mind that we kind of, we move through this this spectrum when we're talking about kids with autism, but we really look at two categories or two silos. And the first is the social interaction component. So these children have difficulties with verbal and nonverbal communication, both giving and receiving that information. And so it's difficult for them to understand language. It's difficult for them to form relationships or understand the differences in relationship. So how do I know who is a family member versus a friend versus who is my peer versus who is in authority? And that can be really tricky when it comes to treating these patients. And then on the other side, we have the behavioral responses. And I think the thing to hang on for these kids is they really value sameness, repetition, Mm -hmm. and scheduling. They may be very fixed on how their day is run or a certain toy or certain clothing, certain pair of shoes that they need to be able to function effectively in their day. And that sameness is really hard to change for some of these kids. They Mm -hmm. also have sensory dysregulation, and the way that I describe this to my families is a little bit silly, but NASCAR and race car driving is very popular in the South where I live. And so if you think about a racetrack, you've got a bunch of cars, they're going in a circle all in the same direction. Some are exiting to take a pit stop and some are coming back on from a pit stop. But once you're on the track, things should run pretty smoothly. That's sort of how our sensory system or our neuroregulation system runs. Everything needs to go really well. Kids who have autism have the racetrack, they have the cars, but it's almost like the racetrack is full of potholes. And they have learned through their experience how to navigate around those potholes. And that's their routine. They're looking for a locus of control in their day and in their environment, because if they hit a pothole, it's a meltdown. You know, hear that word with kids with autism, meltdown. It means something has happened that's disrupted their routine 
And depending on where the child falls on the spectrum is going to tell you how they're going to react. They may completely fall apart or have a wreck, as I call it, or they may be able to stop the car, put it back in drive, and then get back on the track and keep going. It really just depends on that spectrum. And I think that sensory dysregulation is what is key to needing that professional help. Mm -hmm. Someone who knows what autism is, someone who knows what pelvic health is, and how to bring that all together. I want to say, too, that part of that sensory dysregulation is also, you know, we know our five senses, smell, sight, see, taste, hearing, uh, but we also have internal sensory regulation, and that has to do with emotional and behavioral responses, but it also has to do with being able to interpret our body signals. So children who have autism may not be able to sense that their bladder is full or that their, their rectum or their colon is full and they need to have a stool. They may feel something in their body and they don't know what it is and they don't like it. Um, it's overstimulating for them. And then that leads to abnormal behaviors. So Mallory, I was keying into that as you were talking about Joseph and you were saying when he wouldn't poop, his behaviors would be worse. I mean, he would act out more. That's 100% true because his body knows something is wrong and he just can't tell you what it is. He may not even know what it is. He just feels that wrongness mm -hmm. in his system. I love the That's race really big track analogy. I'm, I may have to steal that from you. That is so good. <laughs> I mean, that explains everything. And I'm the mom of a 12 year old and I've never thought of it in terms like that. That is just a really beautiful way to describe it to people who may not understand it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. Cause I think so many of us, me included, I don't have experience in that. That's not my professional experience and it's not my personal experience. So it is hard to understand and know really what you go through, Mal, on a day-to-day -day basis to try to help him with his routines and to help avoid those potholes. And I love that too, Whitney. Yeah. That was a, that's an awesome analogy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, really great. Well, I think it would be helpful for the audience too to talk about some of the kind of the, the normal issues that we use that in air quotes. I'm putting up my air quotes here. What are some of the typical developing things that we think about from a pelvic health perspective? Because you see children, not just children with autism, you see mm -hmm. neurotypical children. So right. can we talk about that and some of the things that you see and maybe define those too? Sure. And I'll say too, they're very similar to what we see with children with autism. It may just be a different mechanism. But I think in the United States, most of our children are potty trained somewhere around the age of three. And a lot of pelvic health issues, urinary and bowel issues that occur in typically developing children in the United States start at potty training. And it doesn't mean that the parents chosen the wrong choice. It doesn't mean that they've started too early or too late. It's just something has happened in that time that has led this child to have an adverse reaction to potty training. Statistics tell us that it takes one, one painful bowel movement for a child to start withholding stool. So the body remembers, the child remembers having a painful stool. And now they start sort of clenching and trying not to poop because there's a fear of pain associated with passing a stool. And with kids, typically everything starts with constipation. That tends to be the precursor for all of the other events. And so when these children get backed up with stool, the first thing we kind of see happen after that is urinary incontinence because there's so much stool inside the rectum. It's putting pressure on the bladder and now the child is, is urinating and can't control that. Or we might even see frequency, which they're going all the time because they can't hold as much. We might see urgency again, because we can't hold as much. And so they, they feel that urge and they're like, I got to go to the bathroom right now. And they're running to the bathroom. Um, another thing that we see as sort of a sequelae or a leading after constipation is incopresis or fecal incontinence. And Mallory was talking about this with Joseph. And what it is, is when you have a large mass of stool in the rectum, and the rectum is the holding area for the stool before it exits the body, that large mass of stool kinks the pipe, clogs up the pipe. 
And then the liquid stool that comes from the upper part of the intestines runs into that clog and it gets really sneaky and it slips around that fecal mass. And that's what starts to come out into the child's underwear or their pull up. And so a lot of my parents will come in and they'll say, my child is pooping their pants all the time. And I say, maybe they're constipated. And they're like, no way. They can't be constipated. They're pooping like six times a day. But what they're not realizing is that the child isn't completely letting go of all of that stool. And so that stool is kind of sneaking around. We call it sneaky leaks in my clinic. We can can so tell you're a pediatric (laughs) physical therapist. I I I know, I know. I have all kinds of fun sayings. It's really a fun group of people to work with. So we've got constipation. We get urinary incontinence frequency and urgency. The fecal incontinence can then happen, or we can get the impaction, you know, where it just gets so stopped up that we've got to go to the hospital for our clean out. We call that the Drano, but no kiddo likes that. You know, they don't like to be in the Mm. hospital. It's scary and there's tubes in their nose and people are inserting things into their rectum to help them to clean out their body. And Mm -hmm. y'all, that's traumatic for kids. And some kids do this over and over and over. And it's just this cycle When sometimes it's a muscular problem or Mm -hmm. part of the problem is muscular and we can address that as pelvic health pediatric therapists. It's just a crazy nuance of symptoms. And I'll say too that Mallory, I hear similar stories from parents who have children that don't have autism. This is the one area of physical therapy where I feel like I'm biased, yes, but we make the most impact for our patients because no one wants to pee and poop their pants. Yes, right. Um, I've seen yes. children be asked to leave schools because their fecal incontinence isn't manageable in the school environment and poses risk to other students. And Mallory, I heard you say you've brought Joseph home and you're homeschooling him. Was that part of your experience where the daytime routines at school just became too difficult? Well, he was having behavioral problems that were sensory related. They weren't with the constipation, but we've had to bring him home so many times because of leakage and because I refused to put him back in pull-ups. He was a fully potty trained Mm -hmm. child. One thing I was thinking of when you were talking, Whitney, is that I've talked to parents who believe their child is either, well, so my experience uh, initially was thinking he was possibly doing some of it on purpose, like to get attention, Mm -hmm. to get out of things, out of Mm -hmm. school or whatever. And And I'll say too, one of my favorite things about this area of physical therapy is the impact that we can make in our patients' lives. No one wants to be peeing and pooping on themselves when they're trying to live their day. And I have seen Families have very similar experiences to yours, Mallory. I have seen children who've had to be removed from school days, from public school systems, because their fecal incontinence became too much for the school to manage. And sometimes Mm -hmm. the teachers or the staff there at the school feel like it's a behavioral problem when really it's a medical problem. And families find a lot of validation in hearing someone say, hey, this is a medical problem and there are ways to treat that. So Mallory, I'm curious if that was your experience and maybe part of the decision why you chose to homeschool Joseph? Well, certainly school, he he had to be sent home many times from school due to the leakage and so on. Recently, taking him out of school did not have to do with that. It was just a better option for us to homeschool. But it was also, I was able to keep him on a good schedule that the school wasn't really able to really do for him. But I also wanted to bring up the behavioral aspect is something that, because we're always trying to figure out what the behaviors are with kids with autism, certainly with my son, why he's doing certain behaviors And so people that I've talked to have said, well, they're pooping their pants on purpose. And I think it's so good to, to let parents know, Hey, this could be a medical concern. This might not be at all behavioral, but the other thing that I want to shout from the rooftops is I think a lot of kids are considered untrainable and That also could be a medical concern. That could also be that they are really constipated and they're having incopresis 
And these kiddos are put in diapers until adulthood. And I really believe a lot of them, not in every case, there are some very severe cases of children who are unfortunately not able to learn to potty train. But I think, I don't want to throw any numbers out there because I'm not the expert in this, but I think if these kids were put on a, just a schedule that they might be able to be potty trained. I truly believe that, but that's for the professionals. That's for Whitney to decide, but I just think it's exciting. That's why yeah. I'm excited. Well, about that's this. a great this question. Is so exciting y'all. That is Whitney. So what would you have, cause you would say this in a much better way than I I'm sure said it to Mallory with my level of experience in pelvic health, physical therapy, what kind of advice, like kind of walk us through what you would tell a person like Mallory, if they were your patient, you know, Joseph was your patient and Mallory as his mom. Yeah. My first question would be, how is this impacting your life? Uh, because I tend to look at the big picture first because I want to treat the whole person. And for pediatric patients, the whole person includes the family. So that's one of the nuances that makes this very different from treating the adult population is you're treating that child and their support system. You may have to bring in a school nurse or a paraprofessional, whoever it is that's helping that child at school. And so it's really this sort of interdisciplinary, but also community and familial approach. And I try to create a really good alliance with my patients. I am not one of those people that is going to come in and say, do this, this, and this, because that's not going to work for children with autism. Um, their routine is their routine, and I have to be able to insert myself and my recommendations into their routine. So the first thing I would do in treatment is get a very detailed history, and I would ask very specific questions. And I'm using my spidey sense, as I call it, to start to think about what would be the easiest for this family to do, like I may only be able to get them to do one thing and I want them to do 15. What's the easiest place we can start to show success to create buy-in from that child? Because children with autism, yes, as Mallory said, there are those very severe cases where pelvic health, physical therapy may not be the answer, but there are many children where we can fill in the potholes on the racetrack, or we can teach them new driving strategies. Let's straddle the pothole instead of driving <laughs> right into it. And so I always start with behavioral interventions with these kids. How much water are they drinking? And if they have some sensory taste aversions or their thirst reflex is very immature, which is very common in children with autism, how can mm -hmm. we increase their fluid intake in a way that's going to be beneficial for them? What's their daily fiber look like? I will say that I'm not a nutritionist, but there are evidence-based GI sources that I can look to to be able to provide fiber recommendations for children, for children of any age. For children with autism, you might have to tweak that a little bit to find the things that they like, the things that they tend to gravitate towards, because their fixated interest is also part of their diagnosis. And so sometimes you've got to trick these kids into sneaking some fiber in wherever you can. And the favorite physical therapy answer is it depends. So mm -hmm. it's going to be different for every child, how we can increase fluid and how we can increase fiber. Some of the simpler things to do is teaching a child how to sit on a toilet appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of kids with autism, they have struggled with constipation for their entire life. And squatting is a very functional position for them. But we need to make that a little more socially acceptable. Mallory, I've had kids that, because of their sensory issues, need to completely take all of their clothes off and stand on the toilet and squat. Because we need to eliminate as many sensory input sources so that they can focus on the bowel movement. I've had other kids where we can just put a little stool under their feet and get them in a good position for the pelvic floor to lengthen. The schedule is obviously very important. It was very successful for Joseph. Um, I'm going to figure out when the child is already stooling. What's their most common time of day that they stool? And that's where I'm going to start. Typically, we would want a bowel movement to occur sometime around 20 minutes after we eat. There's a reflex in the body that will cause the bowels to move after you eat. But 
that's not going to work necessarily for a child with autism. So we start where their bowel movement is. That's where we begin the schedule, and then we change it over time. For some kids, we can change that time very quickly in a matter of weeks. And for some kids, it can take years. I guess I'm just, I'm not ever going to ask the family to do something that's too hard for them. But they do need to realize they're playing the long game here. So sometimes putting the work in in a short amount of time really disrupts things. It might cause more behavioral outbursts. It might cause more difficulty. But if we can really focus and try to, again, fill those potholes or re-navigate the roadway in this amount of time, and I'm using my hands for those of you listening on audio, just a small amount of time Mm -hmm. will make a long-term change. And it's going to help the patient. It's going to help the family dynamic. And Mallory, I heard you say, like, things are better now. Do you feel like Joseph is in a place where this is something that yes, you can maintain? I, do. I mean, this is, this is recovery is what I look at. I wish we knew the exact day. We can probably figure it out of when we went out to eat and I actually started this journey so that we could have a birthday party every year. That's how big. <laughs> a, 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 a pushing anniversary. A poop day party. Yes. A poop you anniversary. Know, one thing, Whitney, and I'm sure yes. you already say this to your parents. One thing that's, I think, important to, to let parents know is, If you do this, you don't have any freedom right now with your, you know, washing underwear all the time or dealing with pull-ups and having to wipe Mm -hmm. your child, all of the things. So spend this time, kind of what you were saying, and then a few months or whatever, and then you'll have freedom after that. I'm not trying, it's a play on words a little bit, but but really it, it does give you freedom. We were already in our house all the time Mm -hmm. dealing with him. With another child, it was very difficult to navigate school and therapy and my daughter's activities and doing all this. And so when Lori told me that and she said, it'll take a few months to get everything kind of back to normal, I thought, "I, I can't do this. I can't do this another day. But it started, we saw the progress. And when we got to the point to where he was going every day, we were out of our house. We were doing things. So totally yeah. worth the time that we had to spend in addition to the time that we were already not doing much mm-hmm. outside of our house. So, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it's just an example of sometimes it feels yeah. like two steps back before taking yeah. 10 steps forward. Mm-hmm. And, and that can be daunting to someone who's already feeling and experiencing such significant weariness and burden and load, you know, the mental load of all of that. And I love how you were talking about that, Whitney, because I know how you practice and you really are a tremendous support to your patients and their families and how you tailor things specific to them. And I think that's really important for everyone to understand. It's so very individualized and there is help. So it's hard to navigate and figure out on your own. And that's why there are professionals who can help you with this and help you figure those things out. Particularly pediatric pelvic floor physical therapists can look at help with that holistic interdisciplinary care and really fill in with a lot of the education that is needed for families and for the patient that oftentimes our physician colleagues and our nursing colleagues, and many of them don't have the time. They're so very busy in their schedules. And we make a really good team in that whenever it comes to medical diagnosis. I think patients just need to know to look for this kind of help. And that kind of brings up a question, Mallory. I think a good time to talk about this would be, what do you really wish that you'd been told by healthcare providers whenever Joseph was diagnosed with autism, particularly whenever it comes to pelvic health, bowel and bladder considerations. What do you wish had happened or what wisdom do you have for those listening about how we can better communicate with parents and children? Well, you know, now we know that most children with autism and adults with autism have GI issues. When Joseph was diagnosed about 10 years ago, the doctor did not say, this is probably going to be your biggest obstacle outside of behaviors. And he may very well have GI issues. I heard nothing about poop 
nothing about it. Now parents are starting to hear from their pediatrician. Sometimes these kids do hold their, they don't want to poop. They don't want to poop in certain places. They don't want to poop around certain people. Like pediatricians really are starting to get it. But back when Joseph was diagnosed, not the case. And I wish I had known because all I cared about was my baby talking. That's all I cared about. I just wanted him to tell me everything in the world about everything. And then it became all about poop for years and years, you know? And so I was like, if he never says another word. Perspective shift. But I wish I'd had a heads up about that. I think because if I had a heads up, I would have introduced different foods for him. I would have been more cognizant of how much water he was drinking when he was little and, and making sure I had that available for him since he couldn't ask for water it would already be sitting out, stuff like that. So in retrospect, and I don't blame the doctors, the medical professionals of this world. I think we're all learning about autism together. And then I'm learning from y'all about Mm -hmm. pelvic health, pelvic floor health, and how to kind of head off some of those issues that we don't have to have. That's so true. Whitney, I believe you might have some research or statistics about this. Do you have anything for us about children with autism and bowel and bladder concerns. Yeah, sure. So Mallory's right. I mean, most kids with autism do have GI issues. It's 82% of these patients have constipation. And of course, as as I talked about earlier, yeah, 82%. As I talked about earlier, there's also the urinary incontinence and the fecal impactions and the fecal incontinence that come from that. We're talking about 80% of kids have one or all of these issues. The other thing that's really hard, we talked a little bit about it, but the sensory aversions to certain foods or beverages. So that does lead to the constipation. But y'all, I like to read research because I'm strange like that. I can fall asleep to a good research article, but I was actually reading something that was published recently and it was talking about how researchers are looking at the GI motility or the digestion of children with autism, and they're starting to discover that some of the enzymes in the digestive tract of autistic children are actually different. So they break down food differently. And so Mm -hmm. maybe it's not always that sensory feeding aversion. Maybe it's that the child either consciously or unconsciously understands that when they eat this food, this particular food, it makes them feel bad. And so that might be another reason that they avoid that. So is there a way to replace that nutrient that's in that specific food to still get the same effect? Because what happens long-term is children can actually become malnourished because they only want to eat chicken strips and mac and cheese. They're not Mm -hmm. getting the proper nutrients that they need. Then that doesn't feed into normal brain development and healthy brain development. The gut also regulates hormones. So 70% of kids who have autism have hormonal dysregulation. And then that enhances or heightens during puberty. So I'm almost curious for Mallory. She said this problem kind of started a couple of years ago. That would have been when Joseph was in his sort of prepubescent years. So I'm just making connections in my head, like wondering if that, if all Mm -hmm. of that makes sense. It does. It's a huge problem. Yeah. You know, Whitney, I think one of the things that I, hear and and really value about the whole multidisciplinary team approach and value about what we do as physical therapists is really try to help help with getting to the root of the problem. And that's really the desire of the entire healthcare team of getting to the root of what's going on. I think a lot of the the behavioral interventions, the research that you're talking about, all of this is trying to let's figure out the root of what is happening and what's going on. Because what Mallory was talking about, going back to the education she received, because everybody's learning and growing, and this was a while ago, I think I've heard a lot of people talk about Miralax. And so we actually have a question from a viewer in Florida that says, What about Miralax for constipation? This seems to be a fix for everything. So what are your thoughts about that, Whitney? Yeah, that's a tricky question because, again, it depends. (laughs) Miralax is an osmotic laxative. So the way that it works is to basically keep water in the stool so that it can be passed more easily. 
one of my patients actually told me one day, I said, what is your favorite thing to know about poop? And he said, if you don't poop, you die. And I laughed hysterically, but it is true. So if we are dealing with a child who has an impaction or who is nearing an impaction, we absolutely have to do something. And sometimes pharmacological interventions like medications or suppositories or enemas are necessary. So hear me say that, like we, we need to protect the life and the long-term issues of the child. I think where it gets tricky is sometimes we see children on Miralax forever. And what happens is when children are prescribed Miralax, the water is retained in the stool. So that's less water that can be absorbed into their body. And if they don't stay on a good regimen, they end up in this cycle of getting Miralax, having cleanouts. Now we're constipated. So we'll do more Miralax. We'll have cleanouts and have constipation. And the cycle is what's the problem. So breaking the cycle is the root of the problem, Lori, like what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out what the root of the problem is. Or are there several roots? And for me as a physical therapist, the muscular root is important and the behavioral root is important. So if I can intervene there and those are two big roots in this problem, then maybe we can negate the need for Miralax. And so I'm very fortunate where I work, I have physicians who are dedicated to titrating children off of Miralax. They don't want their patients to be on Miralax. Parents don't want their kids to be on Miralax or other drugs forever. And so when we can start doing these pelvic health interventions or the behavioral interventions and they can come off those medications, the parents are super excited, as are the children, because... Most medications don't taste very good. <laughs> right. And just to be clear, as physical therapists, prescribing, recommending medications is not what we do. What Whitney's talking about is how we work with the multidisciplinary team with that. But it is a very common thing to see Miralax just kind of given out for long periods of time. And it is safer than other laxatives. So can you talk a little bit about that, Whitney? Because you know there are some laxatives that can cause long-term damage mm -hmm. to the GI system. Yes, absolutely. So those are stimulant laxatives. So those actually change mm -hmm. the way that the body digests. So it's changing the way that nutrients are broken down and absorbed into the body. And that has been shown in evidence to cause long-term dysfunction in the GI system and can be very harmful for children. The osmotic laxatives don't do that. And so it is a safer in intervention. And that tends to be why Miralax or products like it are gone to first. And if you look at the GI literature, that is considered the first line of pharmacological treatment. And so physicians are doing what they know and what their evidence is telling them to do. And it is right for the right patient. But again, my parents are wanting to come off of this. And so if I can be a piece of that puzzle to help them get to their goal of getting rid of some of the medications on board, then I'm definitely going to be a part of that team. It's mind blowing to me to think about what you just talked about with research with children with autism in their GI tract and some of the differences, but yet some of these medications can also negatively affect that. So you can see how this over time can just continue to create more harm mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. And so it's important that we're having this conversation and that it's being researched. And mm -hmm. I believe there's even some current research as a clinical practice guideline for pediatricians mm -hmm. to screen patients who have autism for GI or gastrointestinal mm -hmm. and genitourinary conditions. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so that research actually has come out in the last three years. And it's just, it speaks to Mallory's point, you know, 10 years ago, they didn't talk to her about poop at all. And now it seems to be coming up more in the conversation because mm -hmm. the healthcare community is realizing that children with autism are different. Their bodies work different and interpret signals differently. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics has actually published some literature that's telling their physicians, these are some issues that we know, and we've known for a long time happen with children with autism, but now let's start to look at this through a different lens. So let's really investigate and screen for these problems when our patients have a diagnosis of autism to make sure that we don't need to refer them to a specialist or even hopefully soon, fingers crossed, the pelvic health physical therapist will be part of that. But I do feel like that's where 
evidence is taking us. And I feel like that collaborative relationship between physicians or other licensed independent practitioners and physical therapists is starting to really solidify. And we're seeing ourselves being referred to more often and asked to come in and educate and consult with teams more often. Which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mallory, what things do you have to ask of Whitney? So I know that you and I've had some conversations about when should you go pee? When should you not? And this isn't just for children with autism. I think other people want to know these kinds of things too. So do I you do. have any questions for Whitney? I am, Put me on the spot. I am so excited about this question. <laughs> do I tell my child to pee <laughs> before leaving the house? Even if they say they don't need to, you're going to be gone. You're going grocery shopping. You're going here. You're going there. You'll be gone. Let's say two hours. Do I say pee now? Cause I don't want you peeing at the grocery store. That's a fair question. And let me preface this by saying I have three children. So yeah. it's not, this is not coming from a person with no children. So that's, we call that jicking or just in case peeing in my clinic. Like we want to nick the jick, like meaning we want to get rid of it. I love that. Um, <laughs> it depends. Ideally, if we are working with the child who we are trying to prolong the voiding interval or have them wait longer amounts of times because they're peeing too often, then I really don't want to ask that child to pee just in case because the bladder is very spoiled. It can run your life if you let it. And sometimes if you give it an inch, it takes a mile. And so if the child has peed recently within their neurotypical time frame, if they're a young child, five, six years old, and they've peed within the last two hours, I may not ask them to go ahead and go to the restroom, but if they haven't went in a long time, I might ask them to go and that's okay. I'm a mom. I get it. I don't want to be in the store and like all the way at the back looking at my lawn and garden furniture that I want and have to run to the front of the store with all the things. Right. I don't want to do that. So I, I get the parent perspective too. Mm -hmm. So it, it really depends. And that's for a typical child. For a child who has autism, because I want to bring us back to that. I don't think jicking is as much of a problem because some of those children, again, they don't realize when they need to void and they may not know when the last time they voided was. And if they get into a store and they're in the grocery store and they feel that sensation or they feel some sort of sensation, that can cause a behavioral outburst, which is not anything the child or the parent wants to experience, especially not in their home. So the child is already overstimulated by the environment of the grocery store, and now they're feeling some sort of sensation in their body that could be that they need to use the restroom. So for children with autism, I think it's fine to do that if that's part of their routine and their structure and they like that. For typically developing children, okay, it depends. Okay. So what you're saying is I win the argument between me and my husband. That's because uh, he thinks everybody should just try to go. <laughs> well, absolutely. All the time. Yes. Like, we're leaving the house That's for great. five minutes. Everybody yeah. go pee. And I'm like, this is why you, you pee all the time. Yes. I'm glad Whitney could help you win Thank an you argument would. with Justin. Mm -hmm. That is always beneficial. Oh, That's true. Yeah. We got to <laughs> exactly stick together, right. don't we? Okay. And <laughs> another bit. question is Is it actually harmful for my child to hold it, like at school, for example? Teachers a have a rule a lot of times. I know my child's classroom does where my daughter's classroom, where you get like points taken away if you go more times than you're supposed to in a given mm -hmm. time block. So mm -hmm. is it okay to say, no, hold it for 15 more minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that is a goal for the child that we have in therapy to prolong that voiding interval, then yes, it's okay to ask them to hold. But I want to preface that by saying they have strategies to know how to hold. So there's right ways to hold the bladder or hold the pee in, and then there's wrong ways to do that. Um, so we shouldn't see kids dancing around or squatting on their foot or doing the pee pee dance, as we call it. They should be using their pelvic floor muscles to hold that back because there's some reflex loops specifically that we're targeting there to help increase voiding intervals. If they have a history of urinary retention or urinary tract infections, those are kids that we really don't want them to hold their urine because they're already having difficulty with that. And so, again, the favorite PT answer is it depends, but it's harmful in situations when it can cause additional Got medical it. problems. Yeah. 
Okay, so I have a funny story for you. So just for our listeners, I have four neurotypical children. And so as a pelvic floor physical therapist driving in the car, we used to drive sometimes 15 hours to come back and visit family. And I would know um, with my children, no, we just stopped. And I would say to them, no, you need to lift your muscles for a little while. You need to lift your muscles. I know that we just stopped 30 minutes ago and you haven't had that much to drink and you haven't had that many things that irritate your bladder. And so we're going to keep going and I need you to think about something else. I need you to lift your muscles. And so that has turned around and bit me whenever we're driving home. And in order for me to stay perky, I'll drink Mountain Dew. And that is a bladder irritant. And then what does that make you do? Go more frequently. And so I'll have to pull over and stop. Or so if my husband's driving, I'll say, hey, I need to pull over. And my kids from the peanut gallery back there are like, mom, lift your muscles. And so anyway, sometimes that can come back and bite us, can't it? Mm -hmm. That's funny. Okay, so... Any other questions, Mallory, that you have for Whitney that would be helpful for Joseph now or for your friends and your community? Well, I think Whitney has already answered this question for me. It was one about encouraging parents in this whole process. And I think the strategy of starting out with asking, how has this impacted your lives? I almost had the ugly cry as soon as that exited mm -hmm. her mouth because this is not just your child, but in the case with my child is he's probably going to be living with me for the rest of mine and my husband's lives. So a lot of approaches with therapists and doctors, not to bash anybody, but is kind of like, what are you feeding him? What are you doing? What are you doing wrong, basically? And I think starting it out by saying, how is this impacting you? It shows I'm not the enemy. I'm here to help. And I think that is so something so delicate, like having bowel movements. And we know that emotions can affect that and everything. And approaching it from a point of view that doesn't bring shame on the family, whether it's the child or the parent, huge, huge, y'all. And just talking mm -hmm. about it. Mallory, that's so powerful to hear that. Because I hear the pain in your voice when you're talking about that and how it feels yes. like accusation rather than I see you. I want to know. Tell me more of your experience. Give me your perspective. That's what I'm hearing from you. That yeah. you, you want more of that and you feel like yeah. that's more helpful for people. So, so that statement alone, Whitney yeah. making that statement alone answers like four or five of my questions which is how do you approach the parent so you can help the, mm. the child? How do you do? And it's like, she's starting off by saying, there's no shame here. We're going to get to the bottom of this. No pun intended. We're going to, we're going to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Mallory, I told you earlier, this is my favorite area of physical therapy. It's so rewarding, but I'm not afraid to cry with my patients and we've mm -hmm. sad cried and we happy cried. I'm still professional. I'm absolutely professional, but I also have children and I realize how fortunate I am sometimes and how hard it is for other people. And I think having that compassion yeah. is so important. And I can't tell you the number of families and please don't hear me say this and I'm tooting my own horn or bragging in any way. I think it's mm -hmm. fair for any physical therapist working in this area, but I can't tell you how many families have said to me, why couldn't we have mm -hmm. come to you sooner? Why couldn't mm -hmm. we have done this sooner? Why did it take us years to get here? And I think that just speaks again to what you said earlier. We're mm -hmm. all growing together in, in this diagnosis and public health and putting all those pieces. The That's puzzle right. isn't complete yet, yep. but we're going to get there. I hope we get there in my lifetime. I know science and medicine yeah. just, they're slow, but my goal is for families to yeah. not have to ask me that question. I love it when they ask me mm -hmm. that question because it makes me feel so good to know that I've helped them, but right. they yeah. shouldn't have to say right. that. They shouldn't have to ask right. me that question. Right. Yeah. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking about pelvic health, whether that is for pelvic health, 
conditions in the pediatric population, in the population with autism spectrum disorders, or, you know, in postpartum women or whoever else this is affecting, yeah. it touches all of us because bowel, bladder, reproductive health, it's all about quality of life. And that matters. And we need to be able to talk about it without shame and to be in an environment where we're not approached about it with shame. That that's just such an impactful thing that you said, Mallory. Well, just remember what I I said to you the other day on the phone. We are talking about something right now that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody's dying to talk about. And if we can just get past the hurdle of this is gross, it's inappropriate. All of us were raised in the South. You don't talk about it in the South. Then <laughs> once we get past that hurdle. People are going to be healed from this stuff. My heart is in the autism community, but there's other people that are affected by this too, other children. This is going to hopefully reach people that will lead them to the path of recovery on these issues. I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, Mallory, I have yes. one final question for you. And I, I know a little bit about what you're going to say about this. And I just find your story and your experience and your wisdom just so impactful and meaningful. And it has been an honor to see how you've grown because as Mallory said, we've known each other for a very long time and just to see your growth in your journey with Joseph. So my question to you is what have you learned from Joseph and what has he taught you as a mother? Okay, I'm not going to cry because that'll just take longer to get this out. <laughs> I'm crying. That's fine. And I haven't even I heard know. your answer. Since you've known me my whole life, you know how I used to be. I was gifted Joseph so that I could be taught compassion because I didn't really have any before. And I used to also be kind of a wallflower and not want to be noticed. And when you have a kid that is shouting things and everything. We get noticed everywhere we go. But what that's taught me is to be bold in life. It's okay to be shy. It's okay to be introverted, mm -hmm. but it's not okay to not speak up for yourself and things like that. So compassion, boldness, loving the unlovely. A lot of that, it's hard sometimes to, to love freely in this situation, to really to show him how much I love him when he's acting out and when we've gone through this months long, years long journey with him, with all of his bowel issues and everything. Sometimes you're just so exhausted. So he's taught me resilience, perseverance, how to have joy when there's poop everywhere. You can still have joy in those moments. You can, it's possible. So, yeah, both <laughs> figurative and literal. <laughs> yeah. Somebody told me one oh, time, my goodness. somebody who worked with him at a school he used to go to, maybe he was, maybe he's your son so that you can learn more from him than he learns from you. And I think that just about sums up our journey is that I know he's learning from me, but the amount that I've learned yes, from yes. him. I'm just not the same person that I used to be. And it's because of him and my daughter who I'm sorry, we haven't talked about mm. because she's amazing, but she doesn't fit into this category, but yeah. yes, both kids. Yeah. <laughs> but but right, Joseph right, in particular yeah. has taught me just millions of life lessons. So yeah, my answer. I love that. That mm -hmm. is such wisdom for all of us. And I'm receiving that for myself as a mom, as a healthcare provider, just receiving your wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Whitney, I know that when it comes to the future of autism, it seems like more and more and more people are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. And I know that you have some information and wisdom about that. What are your final parting thoughts about that? It's a very complex diagnosis and the diagnostic criteria has changed over the years. And the most recent statistic that came out this year is that one in 36 children in the United States has autism or has that diagnosis wow. by the time they're eight. 
and I, I feel like, you know, 10 years ago, it was like one in mm-hmm. every 170 something. Yeah. And don't quote me on wow. that for sure. But I yeah. think part of that is that we are getting better at diagnosing it, getting better at screening for it. My parting words would be exactly what Mallory said. Be bold. I think that as parents or healthcare providers, if we're treating children for other reasons that aren't pelvic health related, we just, or we're community members and we encounter a child, it makes us a part of their journey. And I think boldness from, from the parents, from the healthcare providers is so important to be able to speak for children. Even typically developing children can't always speak for themselves, but the autistic population specifically, they can't speak for themselves. And I think they need people on their side. They need people to be ready and to fight for them and push for them. And the boldness piece is important. Mallory, in early in your journey with Joseph, you weren't being given a lot of information. You didn't know what information to ask. Now you do, and you're a resource for other people through your nonprofit and, mm-hmm. and your relationships in the autism community. And I don't know, I just feel like that statistic is going to narrow more and more over time. But I think that the breadth of knowledge that we have to be able to treat this population from a holistic viewpoint is going to improve as well. I think we need to elevate these mm-hmm. kids and lift them up and push them forward yeah. to meet their needs. Absolutely. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. That is what y'all are doing. It's wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you both for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, your perspective, your stories. They are so meaningful, not just to me, but to anyone listening so that we can work together. This is a community thing, right? We all need to work together and come together and better support each other in this hearing how common that the diagnosis Mm -hmm. is, Whitney, that's just eye-opening. And so we all have education work to do. We need to learn more. And when we know more, and as a little bit of a misquote of Maya Angelou, when you know better, you do better, right? right? And I think that's what we're called to do. And that's how we need to help each other. So thank you guys so much for coming. I do want to just say again, the contents of this podcast are not intended to be a replacement of evaluation or diagnosis from a medical provider. Rather, we have just been sharing professional and personal experiences as a hope to educate you. And so if you need help, seek help from a medical provider, ask the questions. That's part of what Whitney was talking about, to advocate for either your patients, if you're a healthcare provider, or for your children, if they need help and more people brought into the team and the community that can help them to achieve their goals and to achieve optimal quality of life. We're thankful for those who submitted questions. We want to hear from you. So if you want to contact us, you can email us at talk at freedomfound.org. And that's freedom with a PH. So talk at P-H-R-E-E-D-O-M found.org. Or you can text talk to 801-801 and send us a question, send us a comment, send us something that you would like for us to talk about in future episodes pertaining to pelvic health. Thank you again for helping us normalize conversations about pelvic health. There is so much work to be done, particularly to increase the conversation about this within the autism spectrum disorders community. And so it really belongs to all of us, that responsibility to educate and advocate. Thank you for joining us. You have the floor. If you want to contact us, if you have any questions, you can email us at talk at freedomfound.org and that's phfreedomfound.org.